Okay, everybody, welcome back to another ultrasound lecture. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Fox once again going through some uh, new material here, some respiratory ultrasound. But before we get there, I just want to tell you about a little bit of my travels. I was uh, last week in uh, Manila in the Philippines uh, teaching at the University of Santo Tomas where they have a wonderful university. They have a four-year program with 500 students uh, in each class per year. And these are the faculty that you're seeing here. And I went there. Um, it's about a 16-hour uh, flight uh, if you connect through Tokyo. And I went there, and uh, obviously I fell asleep uh, here <laughs> at the end of the whole thing. But everybody was uh, very excited uh, to learn ultrasound, integrate it into their, into their curriculum. So... Um, Um, when you get this uh, lecture this coming week, I'm, not, I'm actually not going to be there. Um, I'm going to be down in uh, Australia at the University of New England, where I was uh, maybe 10 months ago or so. This is a picture of the university I took last time I was there. So it's a beautiful uh, place here in Armadale, Australia, where we're basically doing the same thing, integrating ultrasound into, uh, into their curriculum as well. And um, so you fly to Sydney, and then you take another flight up to Armadale. It's just a, it's a wonderful uh, sort of rural part of uh, Australia. Anyways, just to kind of keep you updated on my travels uh, as you go through these, uh, through these lectures here, this is uh, switching gears now to pulmonary ultrasound. And we're going to be talking about just a couple things here, um, some, some little bit of uh, pulmonary anatomy, but also um, what happens when you get pulmonary edema, a collapsed lung as in a pneumothorax, and uh, pleural effusions or fluid around the lung, and then finally, uh, what pneumonia looks like. Sometimes they come in and y you're teasing between two different uh, diagnoses. Big smoker, um, and he's got also a known uh, poor. Uh, ejection fraction of his heart. 35% is definitely uh, low. It's abnormal. And he comes in with the shortness of breath. And so, you know, it kind of always, always boils down to the same dilemma. You know, is this patient suffering from chronic obstruction function? And, uh, and that's uh, something that I think ultrasound can help uh, tease out. In fact, you know, there's a lot of good evidence out there now in in uh, point of care ultrasound looking at um, chest ultrasound being superior to chest X-rays for differentiating a patient who's in congestive heart failure from one who's in COPD. In fact, um, to the untrained eye, both these images sort of look like snowstorms, probably to a lot of people. But if you look closely, um, you know, you could tell that this has like lines going this way, and this has lines going, you know, horizontally. And they're actually quite different. So this is the COPD patient, and this is the CHF patient. And I'm going to teach you that right now, how to help differentiate that. But we can use ultrasound in the chest uh, to uh, diagnose alveolar interstitial syndromes, pneumothorax, pneumonia, COPD, pleural effusions, hemothorax, and um, also abscesses and tumors in the lung and chest wall. And then ultrasound also helps guide um, painful procedures. I like to say anytime I put a sharp object in a patient's soft tissue, I'm going to use ultrasound to help guide it. And these are the kinds of things that we can do using uh, ultrasound. And um, there's different zones that you place the transducer on the chest. Um, one is the, uh, the anterior zone, uh, or the um, this is where you can see the intrapleural air like pneumothorax, and this is the anterior area. And then you've got the posterior lateral zones here, which is where you see see in all zones, you can help uh, differentiate interstitial alve alveolar fluid um, quite well in th those areas. So the two transducers that we use to do lung ultrasound are the high frequency linear transducer that goes from 5 to 10 megahertz, and also the lowest uh, frequency um, phased array transducer uh, down in that 1 to 5 megahertz range. And this is good for getting between the ribs, and this is good for using the ribs as a landmark to see the pleural line, as I'll explain here in a minute. But if you're running into problems seeing an unclear image, some of the tips that you can do, you have to think about, are 
if the patient has air in their subcutaneous tissue, meaning did air get up right underneath the skin, we all know that air is the enemy of ultrasound. So if air is underneath the skin, you're going to have a lot of problems seeing past that air. Another thing is if a patient has a collapsed lung, you're not going to be able to make a lot of sense out of that lung other than the fact that you can diagnose it, that there is a pneumothorax. But in terms of seeing what pathology is going on in that lung, uh, like pneumonia or pulmonary edema, you can't see if the patient has a collapsed lung. Sometimes it's really important to reposition the patient. That's particularly true when you're doing a pneumothorax evaluation. So if you lay the patient flat, air travels anteriorly, and, um, and that's really the best way. We had a false negative ultrasound last week for pneumothorax in a patient who was sitting upright in the trauma bay for some reason. So you really want to have the patient flat for doing pneumothorax. Um, and as we know from other types of ultrasound, it's helpful to move the patient around, and, and that can be true as well in dealing with some other types of pathology. You want to get overlying obstructions out of the way, like um, like a brassiere or like um, you know the EKG leads or tape or uh, things like that. And then you want to make sure you're using enough gel. Gel is the coupling media for all. Um, if you're trying to figure out if it's normal or not, the first question you want to ask yourself is. horizontal, repetitive, reverberation artifact that originates from the pleural line. Now we can see this in normal lungs or we can see it in the setting of a pneumothorax actually. It's, a, it's an artifact. I want to emphasize that, the fact that it's a reverberation artifact that we can see. Now um, what we're looking for is the repetitive sign. So that's the chest wall up there and we can see the rib shadows. This is using a linear probe. In this case, it's the L25, but got the linear probe. And the distance from the chest wall down to this first line right here, that's the pleural line. And that pleural line represents the interface of the visceral pleura, or the pleural that's on top of the lung itself, and the parietal pleura, or the pleura that's on the chest wall. And we call that the VPPI, or visceral pleural visceral parietal pleural interface, VPPI. And we see that sliding back and forth um, in a patient who uh, lacks a pneumothorax. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but just keep in mind that there's equidistant lines between the skin line and the pleural line, and then the next um, artifact, which is the A line. So that's the whole uh, nature of this business. See, air is not a good transducer of sound, so sound interface right here. That's the pleural line. And this is using now the um, phased array small footprint low frequency shape here. And you can see this linear uh, pleural line sliding back and forth. And that's the actual VPPI right there. Okay, that's the pleural line. And, uh, you know, not seen well are rib shadows. Maybe, maybe I can kind of hallucinate one right here. Um, but that's the thing. When you get between the ribs, you don't see the rib shadows when you use a small footprint probe as opposed to that linear probe where we could actually see both rib shadows. Now from that pleural line, um, these, some of these waves like reverberate um, back to the probe and then create an equidistant and parallel bright arc known as an A-line. And this is what an A-line is right here. Notice it's the same distance. The distance from the skin line to the pleural line equals the distance between the pleural line to the first A-line and so forth. Another A-line is seen uh, down here. And so those are horizontal artifacts, A-lines. Now, if you have absence of A-lines, that means that something in the lung is replacing that air with the substance that can transmit a sound wave, right? So air is the enemy of ultrasound, but when you replace air with blood or fluid or infection or uh, uh, congealed blood like a con contusion or, um, or, or more of a solid structure like a tumor, well, then you're going to lose those A-lines, that, that artifact, okay? So, which begs the question, what are B-lines? Well, B-lines are vertical lines that extend down from the pleural line. So, like, here's the rib, here's another rib, this is the pleural line. We have absence of those a multiple diffuse B-lines, that's abnormal, that's pulmonary edema. And what happens is you've got the interlobular septae of the lung here. These are interlobular septae. 
And you can see these interlobular septae here, outlined by the yellow, these interlobular septae, when filled with fluid, okay, well now the sound can conduct down through that fluid. The fluid goes in the interlobular septae of pulmonary Now conducted by the sound, and that's what a beeline looks like. So again, over here we can see, once in a while we see a few beelines. These are rib shadow, rib shadow, plural line, plural line. We can see once in a while some beelines there. Diffuse beelines coming down, and that's pulmonary edema. Another example here, pulmonary edema using a sector transducer conducts all the way to the bottom of the screen. This I won't bore you with, but I like to just use the term beelines, um, and uh, you can see the multiple term, multiple beelines there. Another example here, when fluid replaces air in the interlobular set down to the bottom of the screen in a common tail artifact known as a beeline. Um, and here we can see a lines. They make equi sorry, they make equidistant arcs coming down here. These are a lines. The first one is the plural line from the skin of the plural line, the equidistant arcs that come down horizontally. Over here, we have B lines. So in this case, if um, you had this patient who had a history of COPD and CHF, you'd be thinking COPD exacerbation. Over here, we're seeing in the same, if it was that same history, CHF versus COPD, we're thinking a medication that can help get the flu. And um, and that's how alter pulmonary edema. Good. Now there is a chest X-ray uh, correlation here. If you wanted to look at something called curly B lines, and it's cool because it means sort of the same thing. This is that interlobular fluid that made it out to the lateral chest wall. Uh, and that's what you're looking at right there. That's that interlobular fluid. So if you put a transducer right here, the sound conduct right down that fluid. Switching gears now to talk about pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is where the lung collapses away from the chest wall, as in this diagram. Actually, this patient right here has a pneumothorax. But it's very hard to see on a chest x-ray, particularly in when the chest x-ray is taken in a supine patient, one laying on their back, um, in an anterior-posterior projection. So an anterior-posterior chest x-ray only has a sensitivity of sometimes as low as a coin toss to pick up a pneumothorax. And that's because on the CT scan here, you see um, if you did an x-ray on the same patient, the x-ray would have to go through skin, fat, sometimes breast, muscle, bone, air. This is the pneumothorax right here. Uh, fat, skin, and then you've got a chest x-ray. It has to go through all those layers. And then that's why you've got all these things like shadowing each other, and that's why it's very difficult to see path. ...characteristic to pick up pathology. And ultrasound, like its brethren with CT scan, also is a slice type of technology. And so the more I think in terms of slices, the less I want to think in terms of rasterization or flattening out of multiple layers, to borrow to a, a term from um, Photoshop, rasterization. Okay, so ultrasound is pretty good. The, the data is out there. Another article was published in February of 2012 doing a meta-analysis and showed that, indeed, ultrasound is much better than plain films to diagnose a pneumothorax when using the gold standard of a chest x-ray. How do you do it? You take a high-frequency linear probe. That's my favorite way to do it. Um, you put it in a supine patient, like the second intercostal space. You've got the probe in a vertical orientation or in a sagittal plane. You go to the midclavicular line. If this is the clavicle here, we're sort of in that midclavicular line. And then we're going to watch the patient breathe in and out four or five times. And then we're going to slide the probe inferior laterally until we get down here to like the 10th, 11th intercostal space in a coronal plane. Over here, we're sagittal, which means longitudinal when placed from the anterior part of the body. And over here, we're coronal, which means longitudinal when placed along the lateral aspect of the body. We're going to look for the pleural line. We're going to make sure it slides. 
and then we're going to do something called Sky Ocean Beach using our M mode. I'll explain that technique in a minute. So once again, plural line. It's between the ribs. The ribs are, are um, landmarks. And we're going to see if that plural line slides back and forth. And sometimes we'll see little comet tails coming down, um, or a couple of B lines will be coming down from that plural line. Now, if you have a pneumothorax, air displaces that interface, making it impossible to see the sliding. Perhaps this will help understand it better. This is a CT scan with an ultrasound probe on it. Okay, so here's the skin, fat, muscle, bone, bone, muscle, lung. Now, normally you don't see lung on ultrasound like you do nicely on a CT scan, but this is for demonstration purposes. You put that linear probe between two ribs. Okay, so here we are, rib one, rib two, and between the ribs we have the pleural interface. The lung slides back and forth with that pleural interface. Okay, now, as the patient's breathing in and out, we can see the visceral parietal pleura sliding against one another. We don't actually see the lung itself because air in the lung impairs the transmission of the sound. But we can see the interface of the chest wall and the lung together sliding back and forth. Now, if the patient has a pneumothorax, which means a collapsed lung, where air gets between the lung and the chest wall, that's what a pneumothorax is, well, now we are unable to see the lung sliding because there's air in the way. Air, the enemy of ultrasound, So, another example, linear transducer and a sagittal plane. That's why I see maybe this is like rib number two here and rib number three over here with their corresponding shadows. I like the sagittal plane because it gives me this nice landmark to see my plural line. And these are little comet tails that make it to the bottom of the screen or B lines sliding back and forth. And that lung sliding tells me there's no pneumothorax. Sometimes that's described as ants marching back and forth. But whatever you want to call it, that's lung sliding. That's normal. This is what a pneumothorax looks like. PTX is the um, abbreviation uh, commonly in the medical literature for pneumothorax. So you see the ribs, you see the rib shadows, and in between the two, this is the plural line here, we no longer see the lung sliding. It's just kind of static as the patient's breathing in and out. This is a pneumothorax. There's no lung sliding. Do you see lung sliding? I see one rib shadow here, I see the plural line here, and indeed I see the lung sliding back and forth. Another technique is called Sky Ocean Beach. So if your eyes are the machine sees things that are moving. So this is the M mode spike seen right here. Okay, so this part of the spike up here corresponds to the skin right here. This next part of the M mode spike corresponds to muscle. And then this part of the M mode spike corresponds to more muscle. And then this part of the M mode spike here corresponds to this white line right here that is the plural line. So notice that we have all this horizontal stuff. Horizontal means static. Grainy means motion. That's why it's called M mode or motion mode. You can activate it by hitting the M mode button here or by depressing the button that corresponds to the M mode soft key here. So a pneumothorax looks like, sometimes people call it the seashore sign. Okay, um, When, I should say, the seashore sign is normal lung and pneumothorax or what they call the stratosphere or barcode sign here. I don't want to confuse you with a bunch of different terms and colloquialisms, but but everybody does kind of refer to this as sky, ocean, beach. Where the sky and the ocean are separated doesn't really matter so much, but do you see beach or not? Over here, we see just straight up barcode all the way down. Sky, ocean, 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 sometimes beach. No pneumothorax. Over here, on the other hand, Rib shadow, rib shadow, plural line, M mode spike, and you come down about halfway down that spike, that's where you should see the plural line, somewhere right here, maybe over here. No beach. Barcode sign. Pneumothorax, positive. What do you think? Pneumothorax, yes or no? I'm going with yes. Sky, ocean, ocean, horizontal lines, no motion.
over here, here are those, here's the plural line, a line, a line. You will see that those a lines repeat themselves, okay, in the setting of a pneumothorax because there is that repeating artifact. But on M mode, we see the barcode. So you could say barcode plus A lines equals pneumothorax, if you wanted to. So which one do you think is positive? Good, the one on the left. That's a recurring theme in my lectures somebody pointed out to me. I like to put pathology on the left side of the screen. So um, hopefully I won't, uh, hopefully I'll, uh, I'll, that will continue for the test, right? Uh, so yeah, so you can see here, sky, ocean, beach, sky, ocean, 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 ocean. When they're side by side, they're, they're easy to pick out in M mode. Got the pneumothorax on it. Right side, grainy, motion mode. Okay. Now there's something called lung point. Lung point is the, where you have a, the, it's the transition zone between where normal lung is sliding and where the pneumothorax isn't sliding. And we can see that here. So these are like, these are comet tails over here that kind of slides back and forth. And then over here, we see that out. That is the, that's the trans, I'll try to freeze it here for you. That's the transition zone right there between pneumothorax and no pneumothorax. It is highly accurate. You can say, if you saw that pattern on the screen right there, you could say with very high confidence that this patient has a pneumothorax. Now, um, again, that lung point is the transition zone between where the lung is touching the chest wall and where there's air in the way so it can't touch the chest wall. All the black stuff is air. On a, this is a CT scan demonstrating that. Here's the transition zone on M mode. And we just had this the other day in the emergency department. This is from about a week ago. Um, this is someone breathing over here with their lung normal. And then this is that same patient where on this side of this, so here's a rib shadow, here's a rib shadow. We see lung sliding here. We see the lack of lung sliding there. Something that can confuse people. You want to make sure this thing slides all the way across. This transition zone or lung point can sometimes confuse people. Okay. Now, um, there's other conditions that can cause a pneumothorax to appear on ultrasound, even though there's not one there, right? So these are false positives. If you've got a lot of fluid around the lung, that can separate the lung from the chest wall, and you may not see sliding. If there's a big pneumonia, what we call consolidation, with a, and maybe the patient's got a lot of chronic adhesions or um, uh, adherent connective tissue between the, the lung and the chest wall, making it so the lung can't slide as well. Okay, so that fibrotic tissue over a chronic period of time can result in decreased in ability for the lung to slide nicely against a chest wall. Um, if there's a chest tube in place, and if the patient has advanced chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, particularly with lots of blebs, then you may not see sliding in there as well. So just keep these things in mind. In that young, healthy trauma patient, that's the ideal patient uh, that has, doesn't have any past medical history that this holds up, this accuracy holds up very well in. Now, changing gears to pleural effusion. What does that mean? Fluid in the chest cavity surrounding the lung. The from the side of the body, that's what coronal means. And uh, what we're doing here is we're seeing the diaphragm uh, with all this fluid around it. Your transducer demonstrated here, okay? Diaphragm right here. This is the liver. This is the lung. And what you can do is you can slide it right up into the axilla, and you will see the diaphragm right along here. Now, normally, you don't see the lung because there's uh, no fluid up in the chest. chest. That's normal. That rules out fluid in the chest. But when you've got fluid, which is black on ultrasound, up here in the chest, in this coronal view in a supine patient, well, now the sound can get 
past the diaphragm and into this fluid, and you'll actually see black stuff up there. And it looks like this. So it's the loss of the mirror image artifact that is the pleural effusion. Here's the diaphragm. Here's the kidney. Here's the liver. There's black stuff on the screen somewhere. Where is it? Is it between the kidney, kidney and the liver? Nope. It's over here above the diaphragm up in the chest. Now this, on the other hand, is what a mirror image artifact looks like. There's the diaphragm there. Here's the kidney. Here's the liver. Or you know that actually could be the spleen. They look very similar on ultrasound. Um, actually, I see a hepatic vein there, so this is likely the, um, the liver. But there's the diaphragm there, and you see the mirror image artifact across the diaphragm. That's somebody who has a dry chest. That's normal. So when you do the hands-on session, you should really see that. Which one's got the hemothorax? Either one will look very similar. You'll just see black stuff up here. Acute hemothorax before much like pleural effusion would. Yeah, sort of gave it away. So this is, again, the left side of the screen where the pathology is. i got to stop doing that. So how can you, um, you can differentiate some of these things sometimes between a transidate and an exudate and a hemothorax. Sometimes with the hemothorax, you can see some de debris in there, especially in dependent location. Um, with a transudate, it's almost all jet black and a very uh, homogenous, whereas uh, with an exudate, sometimes you'll see loculations in there, there'll be some echoes floating around, uh, things like that. What about the size of the effusion? Well, um, you could definitely pick up effusions less than 500 cc's, um, but you know, it's really hard to quantify like how many cc's are in there. People are always asking me that. I have no idea. I just say, you know, there's enough to tap. Um, I can definitely make out a place for a needle to go to, and uh, you can make a decision based on that. Um, if I see a few centimeters of distance between the skin line, large enough to actually cause hemodynamic collapse, you need to put a chest tube in that patient right away. Luckily, that's pretty rare. Some other things you might see in the chest, you might see um, uh, s structures here like these, um, these exudates here. You can see um, a consolidated, this is part of the lung that's all consolidated, and maybe this is some exudated material here. This could be an abscess. Hard to tell in a still image exactly what's going on. As you notice, I like to use a lot of video because I can make out a lot more about what's going on. Are these loculations like flowing or not? Are they, are they have that rip? Right here above this. Uh, person's diaphragm, the probe looks backwards to me. This is a, a transitative debris seen here in this, um, above this diaphragm. This are drain the fluid um, off, the, off the patient's chest or out from the chest cavity. You can localize that using ultra. cavity to get into the fluid. In fact, uh, this is the lung seen down here, and um, this is the needle coming in here, and this over here is the lung, and all this black stuff here, that's all that, that pleural effusion. We're just advancing that catheter right underneath the, the, um, the, the transducer uh, into that fluid space to try to um, retrieve the fluid out from this patient's chest. Many of these patients have cancer, and you'll get these, um, these ugly um, you want to get uh, the thing the all the way past the finisteration, it's the black line right there. You don't want to go in past that black line and start your pressure by the fluid to if you think it off of there. Okay, now finally, what about pneumonia? This is the last top we're going to go over here. Uh, pneumonia, you can see it uh, on a chest X-ray. Compared to the gold standard CT scan. And so um, when you've got um, a consolidation is basically the definition of it is loss of aeration of the lung. Uh, with ultrasound, um, the cool thing about it is that um, when, when you've got a consolidation there, ultrasound waves can now be actually transmitted through that consolidation deeper into the chest. And it looks basically like a, you're going to see here in a minute, it's sort of hypochoic, wedge-shaped, poorly uh, defined area. Sometimes you'll see air bronchograms. You'll see this within the consolidation. 
uh, you'll see these bronchograms kind of hyperechoic and moving with respirations. You know, the thing that the pathognomonic thing I like to think about is the hepatitization of the lung. Um, and lots of things can cause uh, loss of aeration. Uh, certainly, edema can cause that, pneumonia or can cause consolidations, um, a lung contusion, and atelectasis, or portions of the lungs uh, that is uh, not filling with air. And, uh, and this is what uh, consolidation looks like when it's due to pneumonia. Um, you can visualize that on ultrasound the majority of the time, and th it basically looks somewhat hypoechoic. Uh, and I really think this looks a lot like the liver. When I look at this, every time I see this, I'm thinking, is this the liver? And um, normally, the lungs got these um, A-lines, right? And we talked about this quite extensively now. You see those rib shadow and then a pleural line, A-line, A-line. Uh, whereas with pneumonia, we lose those A-lines, and we have a consolidation sitting there. Uh, an air bronchogram can uh, look like these hyperechoic, sometimes they're described as horizontal, though not always horizontal, hyperechoic uh, uh, lines with fluid in between the two of them, which is why we can see uh, fluid always makes things more echogenic around it, which is why this is more hyperechoic, and that's more hyperechoic, and the, the fluid is there in between the two. This vascularity. Uh, there in the chest, which normally you don't see because uh, lung is filled with air, but when it's consolidated, well, now you can make out, especially if there's pneumonia there, you can make out hyperemia or increase. You don't normally see that. So uh, this is, uh, so what, what, <laughs> which patient's got the pathology? Mm -hmm. Exactly, the one on the left. So this is what pneumonia looks like. We can see maybe the air bronchogram um, uh, right here where there's a little bit of air, uh, hyperchoic kind of lines coming down. But there's fluid uh, inside uh, there, which is the anechoic stuff, surrounded by the hyperechoic walls of that uh, bronchogram. And this is that hepatitization or that uh, consolidation where it looks somewhat hypoechoic, uh, but definitely um, visible, um, as opposed to over here where the patient's got A-lines. Another example here is interesting. This is all like weird consolidated lung, hard to see. Um, you know, over here when you get next to it, um, so this is again that consolidation. And then they slide to the next rib level down. You'll see they're gonna, this rib's going to bounce over here in a, in a minute. We're going to lose this consolidation. And, um, and then we get over here, right there. I'll stop it for a second. So this is the next rib level. So there's a rib level here. This is the next, between these two ribs here, we can see a line. We can see the pleural line, a line, a line. And then they, they're going to see that lung sliding back and forth. They're going to bounce up to that other rib level, which is where they see the consolidation. And so that's essentially how you would pick up uh, a pneumonia. You'd be bouncing between the rib levels, looking around for something that looks poorly defined and hypoechoic, and maybe has some bronchograms um, and starts to appear to have cons uh, hepatitization as opposed to having A-lines, which is what uh, the normal part of the lung looks like. So when you guys scan um, this week while I'm in Australia, I want you to make sure you identify those uh, A-lines with both transducers, the P21, your L38, and I want you to see lung sliding with both transducers and obtain also not listed your MO tracings on those lung slidings. I want you to look at all eight quadrants of the chest, um, and then um, that usually goes pretty quick, and since you have a lot of time here uh, this week, I want you to catch up and look at the gallbladder, kidneys, aorta, and, uh, and if you have time after that, which you likely will, uh, always helps to get that parasternal long and that apical four chamber view of the heart as well. So I'd like to see all those things. My uh, objectives will be posted up on Merlin, um, for as well as the um, the PDF of this lecture because I know you like that too. Some people like that too. So, anyways, thanks a lot and thanks to my fellows and everybody else for holding down the fort uh, while I'm uh, down under. <laughs>